The Chicago Bears fall to the Indianapolis Colts 16 to 21 in a dog fight that went against Chicago and the late ends of the game. This felt like a roller coaster to walk through, especially given horrible offense early defense you wanted a little more out of late but nick's not here with me today so all you get is me we'll keep it nice and tight on this post game talk through all the ups all the downs and everything in between on this episode of bear with us What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to Bear With Us. I'm your host, Robert Schmitz, editor-in-chief of The Bears Blog, and normally I'm joined by my co-host, Nick Whalen of Football Guys, but he's on the road, so he'll catch us sometime later in the week as we talk through this game. And what a game we have to talk about. Caleb Williams throws 52 times, which was not something I doubt or I'm sure anybody thought would happen in his rookie season. He completes a bunch of passes. I don't have the stats in front of me for about 363 yards, two touchdowns, two interceptions and a sack fumble in an offense that outside of Caleb Williams was only able to generate 55 yards rushing on 27 carries. Then across from him, we have the Colts who were managed here, who managed about 150 yards passing two of the worst interceptions i've seen in an awfully long time and they ran the ball well enough down the stretch or back stretch of the game to click out 21 points and a bears loss so walking through this game how do i feel a little confused if i can be honest with you down the late stretch of the game when the bears needed him to deliver caleb williams seemed to deliver so did roma dunce they finally hit a deep shot a lot of the big questions that I think people had about Caleb about like, okay, how do we feel about his deep accuracy? Well, his deep accuracy looked fine to me today. Did he look a little t- or did he look a tick late on some of his plays? Definitely. But that's pretty rookie quarterback. If you ask me, we have a couple defensive pass interferences, especially to open the game. And we avoided the middle of the field early on also took a couple of sacks that I would love to not take, but I never know what's going on with sacks until I watch the all 22 still for now. Let's go ahead and pin those on Caleb just to be fair to the most doubtful person in the room, right? Caleb Williams also tests a window that he should never test again in his life. Every NFL quarterback has to learn eventually that you can't throw to the flat late. And here, that's exactly what Caleb did. He was lucky that didn't get run down the sideline for a pick six. And then instead, um, I think it's Jalen Jones, the other one, right? Not the Bears uh, player, but the corner from Texas A&M just got drafted the other day. He picks off a pass after I taunted him on Bear with us and shows me what for apparently. Still, the Bears offense could not find a way to get up or down the field until I started throwing the ball ad nauseum, and Cairo Santos doesn't have enough leg on a 56-yard field goal to put the Bears on the board er, on the board early, so we go into the dog fight, where the Colts or the Bears can't seem to move the ball. The Colts in part because Anthony Richardson is just not an accurate quarterback. I'd love to say something less direct or less blunt, but we had multiple wide open opportunities that you could just feel where the or where the Colts quarterback simply couldn't hit the target. And one where he floats the ball so badly over Michael Pittman that it lands in the hands of Jalen Johnson in the early parts of the second half. So you get a great day as far as what you could ask for from the opposing quarterback across from you. And the Bears defense ultimately allows 21 points. It's just a little too much, but it's 7-0 for the early part of the half. I do want to talk about one part of this game that I don't know if it's going to get much shine. I thought that call that, call me a Bears homer, you can. But I thought that call that went against the Bears early with Andrew Billings and Montez Sweat holding up or holding up Anthony Richardson and then Anthony getting or basically getting hit from behind as the ball pops forward and lands in number 97's hands. I am shocked they called that forward progress. I mean shocked. Whether it's Justin Fields, Lamar Jackson, in this case it was obviously Anthony Richardson. I've seen it so rare for ball carrying quarterbacks, especially quarterbacks that look like they are breaking from the grasp of the tackler that is holding on to them. I've just never seen that called forward progress. Anthony looked like he was getting out of it. He did get out of it. He stepped aside and then got hit again. So the fact that they called that down just shocked me, especially when then later in the game, we saw a stack up at the goal line where the Bears defense collided with the entire Colts offense, trying to push Trey Sermon into the end zone. And Sermon was allowed to continue to go backwards and then surge forwards. Uh, But (laughs) whatever, right? 
I guess forward progress will count when we want it to count. And certainly we've got to protect our quarterbacks. Hopefully Caleb Williams gets a little of the same, but that's just all, that's just all cope past a certain point. If I could be blunt with you guys, the bears had their opportunities to make plays. We did not see the team live up to those opportunities. Obviously when the bears finally get the offense rolling a little big, deep shot to Roma Dunze, which good job on Rome for making sure he arrived to the ball exactly in time. I need to go watch it again to see if there's any late hands or anything, you know, it's going to blow up on social media about it, but either way, a long, deep catch for Roma Dunze, Caleb to Rome. That's just fun to see right? The offense finally gets to the point where they're at about first and goal at the five. And we all saw it. They line up in the shotgun. Run number one, two yards. Okay, I guess. Run number two, two more yards, third and one. Run number three, get nothing from it. All this from the shotgun, of course. And then fourth down and goal, you go with a sprint out that impressors we've seen everybody say, by everybody I mean, Eberflus, uh, Shane Waldron, did not talk, but we heard about him through Caleb Williams, who talked, and then now Coleman Shelton also mentioned something. Apparently, the Bears have been practicing this uh, this option all week. It went way against the Bears, and in an opportunity where the Bears could have at least gone into halftime down three to seven, or three to seven, or maybe even seven to seven. I'm not trying to hate on the gumption. I'm sure everybody loved the fact that the Bears were going for it. There was a conservative part of me that thought maybe you take the points, but that's just second guessing in hindsight. I want to just be blunt about that. But that call at that time feels ridiculous and was unfortunately indicative of just how poorly the Bears were able to run the ball when they wanted to. The Colts yawned open nearly all game. If you wanted to run up between the tackles, all you had to do was move Grover Stewart there was plenty of room there, especially if you could get to the second level. The Bears were unable to capitalize on any of that as they end up running for, as a team, about two yards a carry. And let's not forget that most of that was Roshan Johnson, who clicked out 3.8 yards per carry for most of the day. It's, it's tough talking about this game because... I know there are plenty of people that want to assess whether Caleb was amazing. Obviously, he has more passing yards than any Bears rookie has ever had in a single game. And the 11th most passing yards of a Chicago Bears quarterback ever. And you did hear that right, unfortunately. But to call this a great game from Caleb Williams is, I think, kind of seeing what you want to see. This is a Rorschach test, if you will. I liked a lot of the context of what Caleb was able to do. But he had an awful lot of dropbacks to do it. With 52 dropbacks, you're going to have some sweet plays on third down. You got two plays, one called back from a holding, where Caleb broke out of the pocket and did exactly what we saw at USC, slinging the ball back across the middle of the field while on a full sprint. And those are sweet plays. That, gosh, you just get a couple more of those if Caleb sees the field that much better as he gains NFL experience. And the offense should be able to move really healthily down the field. But at the same time, when I'm talking about Caleb Williams game, talking within the context of a game plan where you burned, you just about lit 27 downs on fire with that kind of running game. and did not have any reliable way to move the ball outside of your passing game. Suddenly all of the miscommunications, like we saw multiple screen or screen passes where Caleb and the running back or the receiver involved just didn't know where the other wanted them to be. Was that Caleb? Was that DJ Moore? Was that DeAndre Swift? I truly don't know. And we wouldn't know unless somehow we were inside the or the coaching room with them. But you saw these miscommunications pile up, leading to a truly historically bad efficiency on second down per Robert Mays. The Bears, after this game, trailed only the Can or Carolina Panthers. Not trailed, actually. They led the league in the least amount of second downs converted into a first down with about eight and a half percent of their second downs being converted into a first down. I want you to really stew on that, by the way. NFL let's call it average third down conversion rate hovers between about 35% and usually 45%. It's not like I'm staring at the numbers right now, but generally whenever I've looked it up, that's around where things sit and the bears are sitting at a below 10% second down to first down ratio and the 31st worst team in the NFL, the Panthers up until today, I'm sure were sitting at about 18 and a half percent. So you could double the bears figure and I don't think they no, they wouldn't pass the Panthers number. That's how poor the Bears have been on second down. Now on third down, Caleb's doing some things that are solid. And I think that's something to look forward to. But the moment I really start 
thinking through this offensive plan, the more I just feel like it's a failure on the staff and a failure on a lot of the supporting cast, I guess, to provide anything that we could grade any quarterback with him. I wouldn't consider this fair for Justin Fields, uh, at least not until maybe his third season. I wouldn't consider this fair for Mitch Trubisky either until, again, you hit a point where your quarterback's supposed to be elevating. This is his third start, his second start on the road. And I think it's encouraging that he did a lot of what he did. He didn't seem to wilt the way that I think he did late in the... I can't remember if it was the Titans game or the Texans game. And God knows I'm not trying to talk about mental things like who wilted, who didn't. But I thought Caleb looked poised, was a leader. That's nice, but it's all window painting for a Bears loss that feels like it was right within their grasp. I mean, whether the offense just makes a couple more plays, whether the defense just makes a couple more plays, you had this game in your hands. The schedule doesn't get any easier. I mean, even as we look down the barrel of what was supposed to be a much more fun Rams game than it's looking like, it it doesn't look as fun anymore as they've been feisty with the San Francisco 49ers. Then you look a little further. Andy Dalton and this Dave Canellis Panthers team are playing some ball, smoking a Raiders team, at least right now as I record this, that just beat the Ravens, er, and the Ravens are running all over the Dallas Cowboys who beat the Browns. You get it. There's NFL parody, and it feels as if every team can beat just about every other team in the NFL any given Sunday. You've heard it before, and yet somehow the Bears feel fairly predictable. The Titans, their one win, fall pretty flat against a Packers team that does not have their starting quarterback, but the Bears will likely not be so lucky, and if they are, there's a point, isn't there? This may be the most emotional thing that you guys have heard me say on this podcast, but I am starting to wonder if there's a point where the Bears are so hard-capped by their coaching staff, who burned a timeout because apparently we just weren't ready for the Bears to finally throw a touchdown. I mean, What happened? We've got Adam Johns out here, who I think does great work, legitimately speculating that Caleb and Rome interacting over who gets to keep the football may have created a time or a necessary timeout. And then they hard cut to Matt Eberflus and he looks lost on the sidelines. He sends on the field goal unit. You could see him point the finger for one, which is to say extra point. And then bang the other way. Uh, or like we need a timeout so that we can go for a two point conversion that frankly, Caleb should have been calling the moment that it got or the moment that they scored, or at least that's generally what I've seen, whether it's any other quarterback in the NFL, you go back a little further, whether it's Jay Cutler, Andy Dalton, Nick Foles, you see pretty much any veteran quarterback immediately call for the two point conversion in a situation like that. Sure. Maybe the rookie gets a handle on it and has it, but also the Bucks got to stop somewhere and one more timeout would have been the difference between the Bears potentially getting a chance to try to score a game-winning touchdown with 40 seconds left and not. Every one of those timeouts matters. All the little mistakes matter. Jumping off sides on fourth and two matters. Being unable to cash in on a gift of a roughing the passer penalty matters. Not being able to get any points off turnovers matters. And I'm all for giving Matt Eberflus every chance we can. You and I, whoever's listening to this podcast, we don't have any control over this. So we've got a long season with Eberflus either way, but the glow up and the new beard and the new stylist, that all starts to feel a little thin when on Sundays you feel like you get exactly the performance that you would have hoped for out of Anthony Richardson. You get a pretty, at least workable performance from Caleb Williams, at least workable. I think he gave you plenty to work with. Maybe you disagree and you find a way to lose regardless. I think that's tough. Jonathan Taylor has a, has himself a very good day running the ball, as he, against a Bears front that's been able to just about shut the door on everybody else, was able to run for 110 yards on 23 carries with two touchdowns. Alec Pierce is the receiving leader for the Indianapolis Colts, and he gets hilariously open, even though the Bears are sitting in what you would hope would be a shell that keeps the Colts from doing the only thing that you know they'll do, which is throw the ball downfield. He breaks loose anyways, and I'm frankly almost surprised he didn't score. Uh, Tyreek Stevenson and Andrew Billings get banged up in this game at different points, both en- er, come back into the game, but it is all for naught as the Colts are able to grind out a win that keeps them from the dregs of 0-3, but puts the Bears right back in the crosshairs of 
what is this season going to look like? And if there's a point where I'm most glad that I don't have Nick on here, Nick, I love him so much. Nick, you are the best co-host that I could have asked for on a podcast like this. But you live in Wisconsin. You need the Bears to be good. And I don't blame you for looking at a, or for looking at the Bears in a situation like this and saying what most fans will. It's a long season. It's a young team led by a rookie quarterback. If they get to December and they look better, plenty can happen. Don't you remember how the Bears started last year? And in general, I agree. But any prediction that I made early in the season, especially before the season of a potential 10-7 and season, relied on winning a couple of these games early. And that means that the Bears need to play better football or else they're probably not coming out or probably not getting to the Packers game at 6-3, and three, certainly not 7-2. and two. I would just be surprised. Uh, but... I don't know if five and four is in the cards. I don't know if four and five is in the cards. But with the Vikings looking the way that they are, this division is looking, frankly, tougher than the already tough expected division. And I, I don't know. I don't know what that means. The question that I would start asking yourself if, uh, okay, so here's my emoji question, right? And this may sound dark. This may sound doomer, okay? So just bear with me. Get it? Uh, but I want to know. If the Bears finish 7 and 10, what will you be wanting? If the Bear, or where is your water line? And then give me a pumpkin emoji, because I love that pumpkin emoji. Give me a water line. Is 8 and 9 where you draw the line? You say they have to be 8 and 9, or else I need something to change. Do they have to be at least 7 and 10, or you need something to change? Is 6 and 11 good enough? Do they have to be 9 and 8? Do they have to be 10 and 7? What is your expectation when you look at this Bears team and you say this many wins or something needs to change because a game like this felt to me like if you gave the same Bears roster to Sean McVay or if you gave the same Bears roster to Kyle Shanahan, the same Bears roster to Matt LaFleur, yeah, it may feel like I'm cheating that I just named a couple of them or a couple of the best coaches in the NFL. So let's switch things up. If you gave the same roster to Ben Johnson, or the same roster to Kevin O'Connell, or to Dan Campbell, or to Brian Flores, or other coaches that are just in your division right now, do you think that they would have lost to the Colts team that played the way they did today? Because I really don't know. I feel like that was a game for the taking. I feel like that was a game that ends up looking like a missed opportunity. And maybe one day, maybe one day we'll look back and we'll say, yeah, it's part of the process with fond memories, because that was the first time Caleb threw for over 300 yards. That's something that I believe Fields only did one time. If not, he did it twice. Uh, Mr. Trubisky obviously did not have like a ton of 300-yard games. I know that in week three, it becomes the earliest I've seen a Bears rookie quarterback have a multi-touchdown game, and that's in the recent slew of rookie quarterbacks, so you may not count it. But and also, I'd actually need to go back and look and see if Tyson Bajan had a multi touchdown or a multi passing touchdown game any sooner. But it's encouraging after a 93 yard game and an 175 yard game to see Caleb Williams. I really don't care what you think about whether or not I, I actually, you know what? I've heard a couple people mention garbage time. Garbage time is guided by win probability, in my opinion, where when you're below about 5% win percentage, you're probably in garbage time. But this was not that. The Bears were down scores, sure, but I don't think that there's any ever any point where you're in garbage time when a score, a stop, and a score would give you a win or a chance to win. And if the Bears had stopped, which, you know, ifs and buts, but if the Bears had stopped Jonathan Taylor on the run that ended up becoming the 13-yard run that iced the game for the Colts, the Bears had a shot at trying to get into the end zone with 80 seconds. Things like that happen every Sunday in the NFL, and we just saw something similar with the Falcons against the Eagles. So seeing Caleb Williams throw for what I believe is one of the highest yardage, total raw yardage passing performances in the NFL this season, given again, he threw it way too many times. I, I don't know how you don't see that as encouraging, especially given where we have been. But I also think if you're mad and you're looking to vent, then I understand because this is a frustrating Bears team, and frankly, the cyclical nature of these Bears teams is even more frustrating than the result itself. Somehow, you knew this Bears team. I, I don't know. Maybe this is how I feel. 
Maybe you don't feel this way, but somehow you knew the Bears team was going to find a way to leave you uninspired on a day like today. I knew it all week. I kept joking with friends here. Or I'm ready. I'm ready to score nine points and get mad about it. But instead they score 16. I guess we take our small victories somewhere, but somehow the Bears have a quarterback, a rookie quarterback that throws for 363 yards and two touchdowns. And then you add the rest of the context. You find out they lost. You find out he turned it over three times. You find out that the running game couldn't move the ball at all. Defense is hard to watch, I think, well, at least in real time. But it did feel like the Bears' zone coverages left all kinds of guys open, some of some deep, some underneath, and that Anthony Richardson, when throwing the ball, just missed them and that the opportunities were there. Then when they ran the ball, the Bears didn't have much that they could do about it, and that's the Owen, or that's the formerly 0-2, now 1-2 Colts. So what is the rest of the year going to look like? Are the Bears going to be able to go toe-to-toe with teams like the Cardinals and the, I mean, for honestly, this is like, forget the Seahawks, right? Forget the 49ers. Are the Bears going to be able to go toe-to-toe with the Patriots? Your guess is as good as mine. And I guess we'll find out when we'll find out, won't we? That's what the games are for. But at least right now, if you asked me to dipstick things, I am worried about the direction of the future. I think that complaining about Kev, or Shane Waldron is well, well uh, allowed. I've seen some people ask, should be we should we be worried? I really don't know how you wouldn't be worried. I hope I didn't say this in the 20 minutes that I've been ranting, but the moment that in week three, we can't get more than 55 yards on the ground game. Therefore, the only sensible decision is to abandon the run game and leave our rookie quarterback in a position where he needs to rescue our team. I think that you've failed as an offensive coordinator. I think it doesn't matter who's injured and how they're injured. You look at Sean Payton and Bo Nix running, like smashing. Can't remember who they faced today. I just saw that they won. Uh, the Buccaneers. They they beat a Buccaneers team that's been smacking everybody, at least right now. Maybe the Bucs had a bunch of injuries that I'm not aware of, but it felt like Caleb Williams ended up left out on an island. And I guess he performed decently, given that he was left out on an island, but... I don't really like leaving your rookie quarterback on an island, and I don't feel like that was what Shane Waldron was hired to do. I think it's well worth asking questions about Chris Morgan, the Bears' offensive line coach and run game coordinator, because this run game looks about as bad as some of the worst Nagy years, and those teams couldn't run the ball at all. So I don't know what to talk about sometimes when it comes to this Bears team, because everybody has wanted to make it about the quarterback since 2017, since 2018. We want to make everything about the quarterback. You could even argue that we did it to some degree with Fields. He goes to the or he goes to the Steelers, and even though I mean he's playing much cleaner football, past a certain point, is it the jersey? Is it the organization? If Ryan Poles fully intends to break the cycle, I would love for him to prove it. I don't know what that means. I, I'm not asking for something outrageously knee jerk, but performances like today just can't be a part of it until or unless there's some massive surge in December and the Bears become a team that's more than who we thought they were but this Bears team is who we should have thought they were because it's who they've always been and it's week three you don't need to be super doomery they were 0-4 last year so I guess 1-2 is better than 0-3 and and if this is our Broncos game then okay at least something better is coming I guess but I I don't know it is hard for me to look at a defense-led team Getting a performance like that from Anthony Richardson that gives up that much on the ground when you know the ground is just about all they got. I mean, when the Bears knew the ground was all the Colts had, they managed to get a stop. Then they got another stop, which turned into a long drive. Then, sudden change, they allow a touchdown. I don't know. It's not the defense's fault, kind of. But football's a team game. I would have loved for Cairo to hit one more foot, or to hit that 56-yard field goal. I would have loved for our kicker to have 65 yards of leg to at least attempt the ball that ends up being the Hail Mary that pads Caleb's stats a little bit. You strip out the Hail Mary, he still three, throws for 300 yards in an offensive ecosystem right now where the NFL in general is not seeing explosive offenses left, right, and center, but it feels like small beans past a certain point. You either win the game or you lose the game. And if you lose the game, people get mad. And if you win the game, people manage one way or another. The Bears lost this game. So all of the box score statistics 
all of the passer ratings, all of the targets, all of the tweets, they all end up, you know, bummers. So I don't really know what to tell you. I really don't. But I don't think we needed to do anything other than potentially adjust our expectations on what this Bears season is going to be. I'm not stoked about that either. To be honest with you, I'm telling you that because I think it's the truth, not because I like it. What I've tried to do on this channel since day one is be real with y'all. And if Nick was here, I would challenge him on if he was saying anything about this Bears team potentially still finding a way to be 10 and 7. Because if they don't, if they're going to be, they're going to need to quickly find a way to rise to the level of better teams that exist in our own division right now. If the Bears go 1 and 5 in the division, I would say that that's about right. And if they go 0 and 6, I'd say I'm not shocked. And that's not good. Nobody's going to have a good record if you're 0-6. So if this sounds unbelievably negative, I guess I apologize, but I think that's the case. Right now, they need major steps forward from either defensive or offensive personnel, ideally offensive. But the good news is, I think their young quarterback gave them something to build off of. I think their young receiver looks very good. In a podcast like this, I didn't get enough time to talk about Roma Dunze and how the separation that we saw from last season or not last season, last week, turned into production today. Caleb Williams said in his presser uh, after the game that he walked into today with a focus on trying to get Rome the ball more, and he did, and I thought Rome actually looked the part. There's a couple of circumstances where Rome's still making rookie mental mistakes that I think can get better, but those will best be discussed in the film review on Tuesday night. The more important thing is that Rome is looking like the kind of player that can be worth that number nine overall pick. And if he's there and DJ Moore finds a major functional point to be used in the offense and Cole Komet can produce just like we saw him today because he was a darn near a hero on third down, including that third down where he ends up tripped up. The Bears have to go for it on fourth down. And I frankly thought Cole got it the first time, at least when I watched it live. But I think that all of that is looking towards the future and requires some perspective because kind of implies that, yes, we're looking towards later in the season to potentially score some points, but it also means that we're accepting the offensive line is what it is, which is not super great. I wouldn't be surprised if Darnell Wright looks good on film review. It's not like I think he had some incredible game as a run blocker, but the Bears threw it 52 times and I didn't see any pressure come from the right tackle, but I don't know. Offensive line's always tough to watch live. Uh, Tevin Jenkins is playing okay football. I did not love the way that he gave up the first sack of the game, but it's hard to know whether anybody was open downfield. I hope Braxton, I don't know. Talking about the linemen ind independently is particularly tough in a game like this because they threw it 52 times, for crying out loud. They dropped back 56. So, messy game that the Bears almost found a way to win, but they didn't. And a Colts team that needed a win gets a win. And a Bears team that may have needed a win more than we would like to admit doesn't get one. What does that mean for next week? As the Bears welcome the Rams and Caleb Williams walks back into Soldier Field for his second start or for his second home start. What does it mean for the rest of the season? What what is any or where is this team going? What should we expect of them? What does George McCaskey expect of them? What does Ryan Poles expect of them? I don't know. There are questions that I'm dying to have answers to but we won't get any answers now. I'm excited to air talk through this game again on Tuesday, but until that time, if you enjoyed this podcast, let me know. Thank you for putting up with me just ranting by myself. I know it's probably a little roundabout and a little confusing. Everything's a lot easier with an outline and a partner to go back and forth on, but got you something, which is all I can hope to do. You guys enjoy yourselves. Have fun on or have fun this Sunday, Monday, etc. Hang tough, bear down. And thanks so much for bearing with me.